Good morning. Okay, Dwayne's awake. <laughs> Anybody else? Good morning. Good morning. There. Okay, now we're getting there. All right. We want to, if anybody's out in the foyer, I'm sure our ushers will bring them in. And we just want to welcome everybody here, especially our visitors who are here, especially for Ethan as he's getting baptized today. And we're also hearing other testimonies today. And that is, I used to probably as a teen go, oh, testimonies. But now it's um, an opportunity to hear how God is working in other people's lives. And that is exciting and wonderful just to hear as people look back on their lives, long or short, that God brings people through many things, and that's exciting as we, as we hear and worship together and experience that together. So I'm going to ask you to stand as we call each other to worship and sing Mighty to Save. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a stranger, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Of salvation, 
Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. It is a blessing and a privilege to be here. It is so nice to see this place nice and full with people, and thank you so much for joining us. We have some guests from out of town to come and witness the baptism and, and others that have joined us maybe for the first time. Uh, it is a wonderful opportunity to witness baptism, to be a part of church fellowship and to worship God with one another. So a special greeting to you. Uh, Welcome to those of you joining us online. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, a few announcements to get into before we turn things over to the worship team. Uh, obviously, we've talked about it a few times already. It's Baptism Sunday today. We're super excited about that. Uh, prayer Warriors, if you've got your journals and you'd like to record what we uh, are, are praying for this week, Church of the Week, Melville Baptist Church, be in prayer for Pastor Jonathan and his wife Kata, and as well as for Jesse and Chelsea, the, the youth team out there. Uh, Families of the Week, Colin and Gail Henschel, Pat and Ivy Rapchuk, be in prayer for them. And Missionary of the Week, Shan Reed uh, serving in Japan. Now, for, for Shan, there, it looks like there's a little bit of a shuffling in terms of the leadership structure. Uh, a missionary is not intended to be a missionary forever, or at least in, in one place. Uh, the mission in Japan has actually reached a point where a Japanese pastor is taking over leadership uh, in this ministry, and that's what we want to see. We want to establish churches in an area and build them up until they are self-sufficient, and that's kind of the transition we're seeing. So be in prayer for Shan and the other missionaries in Japan as this transition takes place, this Japanese pastor takes over, um, and uh, they kind of figure out where, where, their, where their place is in ministry. It's exciting to see uh, the missions established and growing to the point where they are becoming self-sustaining churches. So we're excited about that. Um, continue to be in prayer for, for Ethan for baptism today. Uh, if you feel called, if you have not been baptized yourself and you feel interested, there should be some little cards in the pews in front of you. Those of you online, you might need to leave a message on Facebook and or YouTube or give me a call. Uh, that would work as well. Let me know of your interest in baptism. Uh, you can fill those cards out. There's little check marks for baptism. There's check marks for me uh, membership. And by filling those cards out, it is not a guarantee we're going to like take you kicking and screaming and throw you in the tank that is your interest in it you can check it out even if you are unsure and you want to learn more fill those in hand them to me at the end of service i'd love to hear from you and uh yeah we'll see what we can do to uh let you know what you need to know and answer the questions that you may have um Throughout the month of June, we have our Wednesday nights is no longer youth nights. Instead, it is being dedicated to, uh, to the ministry of VBS, so VBS prep nights. So youth, if you're used to coming out, uh, it's very simple because it's the same time you would have been here, 7 till 9, but it's not just youth. It's everyone who wants to come. If you've got a, a crafty talent or a gift, please uh, come and help out the, the team. Audrey or Blair would love to hear from you. Uh, June 4th, we have a, a board meeting and uh, at 9 a.m., so board members, be informed about that. June 5th, next Sunday, Communion Sunday, and also the Sunday that we will welcome into membership uh, new members. So the one getting baptized as well as another individual uh, have shared their testimonies today, and uh, we are excited to welcome them into membership as the, as the time comes. And uh, June 10th through 12th, is the youth retreat. So Pastor Braden has been planning this for quite some time. Uh, those that know about it already should have the registrations in. Are you taking any more registrations or is it closed off, Braden? Closed off. If you missed it, you missed the boat. But those of you who have signed up, you know all about it. You know what you need to bring. I believe Pastor Braden sent an email out about those things and it's going to be a wonderful time. And when they come back from the youth retreat on Sunday, June 12th, they're going to end here at the service. Isn't that an awesome idea? And uh, that will be Pastor Braden's last day. We're going to follow that up with a potluck lunch as a thank you and appreciation for, for Pastor Braden. So be informed about those things. Be planning what you're going to bring for that. And uh, it, it's going to be a wonderful time. And also, check your mailboxes. June calendars are available. Anita has worked very hard on getting those ready. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I have. Worship team. The next song, I'm um, happy to be able to sing this song. It's apparently Ethan's request. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know other people were giving testimonies, and um, I missed the boat on that one, so I didn't ask you for your favorite songs. 
but uh, this is uh, Ethan's request. So, um, my lighthouse, and I need those who know it to sing really well, and we all need to stand up. songs <laughs> you know the that's why we have the double podium here because all the music is like five pages long so <laughs> Jerry says 75 pages in total so we're singing them all and one of my favorite ones is amazing grace my chains are gone because God that's what he does he gives us amazing grace Amazing mercy and frees us from whatever binds us.
And it is his amazing grace that we can um, face tomorrow because he lives. And I especially love line two, and you'll know why when we get there, because we've just been to Manitoba and held a very special little boy. <laughs> for um, our offering and then I'll turn the service back to Adam.
Father, we are just so grateful to you for your mercy and for your grace that you break the chains that hold us down and that because you lived, because you died and rose again, we can face tomorrow. And Father, I just thank you so much for all that you have done for us. And we just pray that this offering that we've given to you, you will take and bless it, Lord. Bless those who receive it, who spend it, and who use it to further your kingdom. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, we'd normally go into a time of scripture reading, but because we have a few testimonies to share, uh, Andy, I was wondering, would you be willing to share yours first? Thank you very much. Andy, we welcomed into membership, uh, was it last month or the month before? I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping track of memory, but we uh, had encouraged him to share his testimony and, and uh, said he could wait until Ethan gets baptized. So, Good morning. My name is Andy Sawchuk, and uh, <clears throat> I've been coming to Bay Park Baptist for nearly 20 years. Joan and I have been married uh, uh, for nine years, and Pastor Walter married us. And, uh, and nine years? Okay, it's 11. I'm sorry, dear. <laughs> My son Greg uh, always uh, always tells me, he says, uh, uh, the Sawchuck boys uh, married two Jones, but I uh, married number one, and my bro and his uncle Alec uh, married Joan too. <laughs> I better get my glasses on here. We have five children and ten grandchildren and four great great grandchildren, both of. Both of us, uh, probably not too many people know that both uh, Joan and I lost our spouses in, in, in the mid, uh, when they were both in their mid 50s. At that time, uh, for both of us, it was, it was a tough situation, but, uh, but through the Lord's guidance and showing us the way, we survived it and we, we are very grateful to, to Him. I was brought up in a, in a God-believing home. My mother was a big influence on me regarding God. She always told us to be respectful to older people and watch what you say and do because God always has an eye on you. And if you believe in God, he will always take care of you. I remember coming home from grade three or four and telling my mother that uh, the teacher in school said that we came from apes and monkeys. She turns at me and uh, said, is your teacher crazy or something? She has the, the Ukrainian accent. You didn't come from apes and monkeys. God created you. So we learned from the get-go who God was. I, was. I was baptized at the age of 17, being a teenager, like most uh, boys will be boys. I did a lot of bad things. But bad things that I regret, but as we serve a God that will forgive us if we ask, it, ask for it, and I did. Events in my life where the Lord took care of me. In my early 20s, I worked for the Department of Highways between Purdue and, uh, and Bigger's 20 mile stretch. And, and if any of you have gone on that stretch, it's a beautiful highway, isn't it? <laughs> It rained for two or three days uh, the, the week I worked there, and uh, uh, it was very slick and muddy on, on the highway. We were going down the road, and we went around the, this curve, and the car, uh, the, our uh, car was slid sideways into the ditch, right? We went down sideways, like uh, the drop was about 50 feet. We went down sideways. We drove out of that ditch, and it was a miracle from God that we weren't killed because in those days we you didn't wear seat belts and we thanked him for that too probably the most tough tough uh, situation in my life is when my son at uh, 
uh, bear with me. When he was five years old, um, <clears throat> he was diagnosed with cancer. <clears throat> at the t we lived in Regina at the time, and uh, it was a soft uh, tissue sarcoma that was on one of his nose, on the side of his nose, so he had to have surgery that they, they removed some skin from his nose to put on, uh, from his ear to his nose. And no surgeons in Saskatchewan could do that, so we had to go to uh, Toronto for a couple months. What, what I remember <clears throat> when, when uh, we came back to Regina at the time, every two weeks he had to go for chemotherapy. And, the, the, and what was tough is that here's a five-year-old boy. He knew that uh, <clears throat> it was tough on me. He said, Dad, if you can't deal with this, you can go home now. A five-year-old told me this. But as time goes on, God took care of us and took care of him. He's a fireman today, and he works uh, for the city, and uh, he's been a, a fireman for 16 years. And he's, he's, uh, he's a blessing. he is a blessing from the Lord for us. The Bible says, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in, in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Matthew 30, 10, 32 says, those who publicly, publicly declare that, that he, those who publicly declare that they belong to me, I will do the same for them before my Father in heaven. But those who reject me publicly, I will reject my father also. The, the, the Bible was written uh, approximately, uh, it took uh, 1,500 years to write, and there was 40 different authors, starting from Moses and ending, ending uh, by John. And in closing, I'd like to say that a lot of people don't like to talk about heaven and hell. I didn't write the Bible. God wrote it. So what it says in the Bible, if you don't accept, if, if you accept Christ and, and receive him as your personal Savior, you'll go to heaven. And if you don't, you know where you're going. And I don't have to tell you that. So if you have the opportunity to receive Jesus, take it because you know where you're going. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ethan Weeb, and I'm 13. One thing I was asked in the baptism class is what my life was like before I became a Christian. I'm not sure because I became a Christian when I was five years old. I remember being at Good Spirit Bible Camp. I prayed to ask Jesus to be Lord of my life and to forgive my sins. I was sitting on the top bunk of my bed and my parents helped me become a Christian. Vacation Bible School has helped me grow in faith. I remember the year that my dad did science experiments. I learned about God through those experiments. My dad taught us that everyone si sins but can be forgiven. I see God working in my life through nature. I hear birds in the morning and I wonder how people think that everything is by accident. I enjoy seeing God's creation. I enjoy seeing mountains and looking at the patterns on leaves. I like looking at clouds and seeing them float in the air. I see God pointing me in the direction of becoming a missionary pilot. I want to fly for God and take missionaries to the mission field. My favorite Bible verse is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. The reason that I chose to get baptized is because I want to show my faith to the world. I want to give God my life and worship him with everything that I do. Isn't it incredible how God works in the lives of his sons? 
and in the lives of his daughters. It's delightful to hear testimonies, and I'm sure all of us have been encouraged by it. Uh, We're saving another one for next Sunday uh, when we do our our welcome to membership, so we'll uh, we'll continue hearing testimonies as time goes on. But for now, uh, it's time to read some scripture, so I'd invite you to open up your Bibles. Uh, We're reading from Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through... uh, 1 through 13. Still hear some pages turning. I'll give a moment. All right, Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet... I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were, be- they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Let's spend some time together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the day. I thank you for your goodness and love. And I thank you for your word. Your word that we can draw so much encouragement from. And Father, that changes our lives. And just as we've heard two testimonies this morning, we are so so blessed by those stories of how you work in lives today. That Your word is so important and the stories that are recorded therein. But Father, your work continues and to hear it continuing on and, and how our lives are changed by how you work in them. It's remarkable. And I pray, Father, that you would give us the courage to share our stories. Not just in front of the church when we get baptized, but, Father, when opportunity arises. That when friends and family members and colleagues and others that might live around us or interact with us, Father, as they see that we are a little different, that we do not follow the ways of the world, but, Father, stand out from it. I pray that you would... in inspire within those friends and family members that curiosity to ask why what is different and that opens up the story of how you have interacted in our lives how you have made a difference in our lives and i pray father in those moments you would give us words that just as andy shared in his testimony the desire to see people come to jesus that we might see them in heaven father i thank you I thank you for the way that you're working and moving and calling people to ministry, even Ethan expressing a desire to become a missionary pilot. I pray that you would refine those callings in each of our lives, whether to go to the missions field, whether to come stand before a congregation as a pastor, or whether to be a lay leader, someone from the congregation who's just willing to share the gospel, willing to to assist in any way that you call us to, Father. I just pray those blessings and those guidance. Those guidances, Father. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be in our lives in such a way that you would inexplicably draw us to your will for our lives. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our midst. And Father, for today, we just ask that you would continue to be here in the service, watching over it. And Father, blessing each of our hearts as we get to watch. We do want to pray for the things that are, are, uh, have been mentioned earlier. We want to pray for Melville Baptist Church. We thank you for Pastor Jonathan and Pastor Jesse and the work that they do there. And as your word is, is preached this morning, bless and anoint them, Father. And we pray for them as a church as they look at the summer months and as things slow down, that you would still keep ministry going, Father. 
that your word would, would have its impact even in the summer months. We want to pray for Colin and Gail and for Pat and Ivy. We pray that you'd bless them, that extra special measure, Father, leading them and, and, and showering blessings upon them, reminding them that they are loved and prayed for and cared for here. We want to pray for Shan Reed as she works in Japan, Father, and we rejoice to hear that uh, a Japanese pastor is, is stepping into the leadership uh, in the ministries there. And Father, as that mission matures and becomes a self-sustaining church, we pray that you would continue to bless it that you'd be with Shan and, and others who are serving in Japan as they, they figure out how they can assist this, uh, this church or the, this uh, association of churches, Father, to, uh, to be self-sufficient, to assist them, Father, and then that you would continue to call them to ministry, what, what you would have them do. We want to pray for Ethan as he, uh, thank you for his testimony earlier, and I pray that uh, as, as the time comes for him to be baptized, that you would continue to be with his heart, Father, uh, and help him to, uh, to, to stand proud in your love. You love him as a, as a son. And I th- pray for the inspiration for others that might be considering baptism, that they would have the courage to, uh, to declare their interest. And once again, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness and love and for all that you're doing in, in all of it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I want to call the kids to the, come to the front, but we're going to save the object lesson for later because God kind of gave it to us. Baptism is a biblical object lesson where something we do visibly is a testament to what God is doing in our lives. And so this is something I like to do. Let's, let's make some room here. Awesome, thank you so much. You're not, you're not going to be sitting for very long, but can you guys see the baptistry from where, where you are? Have you ever seen what's inside that, that tank? Some of you have, some of you haven't. I want to I invite you. You can come up, you can come take a look. It's not scary. It is full of water. Uh, don't touch the water and then touch the microphone. That would be very bad, and even we warned against that for, for those. There's not a lot special about it, is it? It's just a tank full of water. There's nice new steps, so thank you, Sawcheck Brothers, for your hard work in, in replacing the rickety old ones. Um, but is it warm? Is it cold water? You tell me. What do you think? You reach in and feel. Don't lean too far forward. We don't, we're not unintentionally baptizing people. You've got to choose that for yourself on purpose, not by accident, okay? So don't worry. You can't get accidentally baptized. What do you think? Is it hot? Well, you know what? Something that's kind of funny, and we've done this before, the water underneath might be a little colder, but we'll stir it up. But anyways, so this is the baptism tank in our church. Other churches might have different ones, uh, but, you know, some people, I actually have my niece here. I watched her get baptized in a, in a lake last year. That was kind of neat. But you don't need much to get baptized. You need a body of water, or at least how we practice it, Right, enough to, enough to immerse you in. And we, we bring you up, and it's a testament. It's a testament to our faith. All right, you guys can have a seat if you've seen what you want to see. Now, we do not have children's church for you guys today. You're going to have to sit with the message. We do have some, I think we have some kids' sermon notes left over, maybe, uh, if you want to have some, uh, some help keeping track of things. But after the message is when we're going to do our baptism, and that's the object lesson, because my boy Ethan is getting baptized, and you guys get to watch. So if you have questions, I'd love for you to ask me, or you can ask your parents, either or. That would be wonderful, uh, because I think it's the, the hope and desire of every Christian to see our brothers and sisters in Christ choose baptism ourselves, because baptism is so important. Jesus got baptized, and if we want to follow him, we got to get baptized too. So that's the beginning of object lesson today. The fulfillment will come with the baptism itself. Let's pray for you guys and you can go back to your parents and, uh, and we'll eagerly await the baptism moment itself. Okay, guys? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for their curiosity and exploring uh, the possibility of baptism. I pray, Father, that uh, later in the service as Ethan is baptized, that these, these kids would consider what it means. I pray that you would be with them as they ask questions, be with their parents as they, they uh, uh, want to help and understand as well, or, or for myself as I can explain it to the best of my ability. I pray, Father, that you'd speak to all of us about the waters of baptism and its significance. Thank you for their willingness to come up to the front today and for filling this pew. Bless them throughout the service and help them to absorb as much as they can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, back to your parents today. Thanks for joining me up at the front.
before the message, we want to sing um, what the Lord has done in me. And I very purposefully picked songs today that either had to do with baptism or our relationship to God and what He has done in our lives so that we can remember our baptisms and just how God has worked. And so I invite you to stand with me and sing this song. Today is a special Sunday, isn't it? We get to watch someone get baptized. Someone actually gets to be the object lesson. Now, it's been far too long since we filled up this tank. This will be the first one since before COVID, but we're really excited about it. Now, I want to ask, why? Why is baptism exciting? Why do we make such a big deal out of it? It's because it's your response to the work that Jesus is doing in your life. It's our response time. It's what we get to do as a sign of thanks and gratitude. And, and oh, Jesus, you say, follow me. Okay, what's the first step? When Jesus gathered his disciples, what did he say? He said those two words, follow me. Those simple words sound so easy, but as we know, if we've been Christians for any length of time, we know that in practice it's a little bit harder than just saying, right? You can say, yeah, I follow Jesus, but what that looks like in your day-to-day lives, well, some days we're going to have good days. Some days is going to be a struggle. Some days the devil's going to be on our backs, tempting us, hounding us, prosecuting us. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will be on our shoulders encouraging us, uplifting us, taking care of us. But if we're going to follow Jesus, 
One of the first things we should be doing in that journey of faith is doing one of the first things Jesus did as He began His public ministry. Jesus got baptized. And so when He says, follow me, that's part of it. Now, the way Baptist churches do it, my one contention with Baptist churches is we tend to be a little bit cautious. We like to do a baptism class. We, do it. we go through the basics of our faith. We, we make sure that our baptism candidates are indeed Christians. And then we baptize them. It could be a month. It could be a couple months. Um, I know Blair in his testimony, when, when he shared, he, he wanted to get baptized. Like We had a baptism. He handed it in his card and he was just raring to go. And we said, well, wait for fall. So it might be a couple of months, Right? But God can use those couple of months. Just ask Blair. That's part of his testimony. <laughs> he shared that on men's prayer breakfast yesterday. But the scriptural example is a little bit different. In scripture, when people came to faith, they got baptized right away. Now, the book of Acts is uh, an incredible resource for these examples where Time and time again, if you have a, a notepad and paper, you can jot down these references. I've got about half on the slide here, so bear with me. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Context being Pentecost. Spirit of God comes down, tongues of fire on the disciples. They start speaking the languages of all the people gathered there, there that day. Peter preaches the most amazing service and sermon ever. 3,000 people come to faith. Peter's message, 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's gospel message right there. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41, the response. Those who accepted his message and were baptized, about, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 converts. And they didn't just convert and go through a baptism class. They went right to the river. Dunk, 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 dunk. Can you imagine? Twelve disciples, 3,000 people, that's, well, I guess 11, 12, depending on whether you count Matthias instead of Judas. Judas obviously wasn't in the picture. But what an exciting moment in church history. That's basically the birth of the church, the explosion from a, a ragtag group of disciples and maybe a few others scattered here and there who had heard Jesus speak and responded to him. And all of a sudden there was a 3,000 strong congregation in Jerusalem, people who responded that day. Later in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 8, verses 12 through 13, there's a report of the ministry of Philip, one of the deacons. He's in Samaria, and he's preaching the gospel. Acts 8, 12 and 13, But when they believed Philip as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. There's no hesitation there. And it goes on to describe the, the Simon the sorcerer, if you're familiar with the story. And Simon the sorcerer made his money from making predictions and stuff. And he came to faith and believed. Later on, he'd get into trouble because he saw the uh, disciples working some miracles and he wanted to pay them for this power and they rebuked him. And, and there's an interesting story there, so check out that reference for yourself. But later in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 39, Philip is again preaching the gospel in every opportunity. He comes across a Ethiopian eunuch who's studying from the book of Isaiah and has no idea what it's talking about. It just so happens to be passages about the suffering servant that if you read, sure sounds an awful lot like Jesus. And so Philip sits down with the eunuch, explains this passage in Isaiah and how it is talking about Jesus, and the eunuch looks at the side of the road, and I, I, I get a picture of like, he's looking in a ditch. And he sees just enough water to get dunked in. He says, what keeps me from being baptized? Can you imagine the commitment it would take to get baptized in a mud puddle on the side of the road? But he did! Right then and there, from the moment he was explaining the gospel, Philip, what keeps me from being baptized? Let's do this. I want to become a follower of Jesus. He was that excited about it, and so Philip said, yes, let's do it. And he did, and miraculous things happened. Again, read the book of Acts. Wonderful, wonderful book in the Bible. Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48 describes when Peter goes to a group of Gentiles, including a man by the name of Cornelius, and he explains the gospel to these Gentiles, and Peter himself witnesses how the Holy Spirit 
is manifesting in them. And, and, and they're able to do some miraculous things. These Gentiles, this was what opened Peter's eyes to the reality that you don't need to be a Jew to be a Christian. And so seeing the Holy Spirit already at work in the lives of these Gentiles, he baptizes them. And there's still other stories of people responding to the gospel and getting baptized. And I'm going to give you a rapid fire list, again, all from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, verse 15. Acts chapter 16, verse 33. Acts chapter 18, verse 8. And Acts chapter 19, verse 5. Eight separate accounts of people coming to faith and within a very short span of time, baptized. Coming to faith. Why? Because they wanted Jesus. They wanted to know more about Him. They wanted to follow Him. They were so excited they couldn't wait to identify with Him. If it takes baptism to follow Jesus, sign me up for baptism. Let's do it. Let's get it going. That's how excited they were. Those who come to faith should be excited about the life-changing choice that they make. And one of those first steps of coming to faith in Christ is to follow Jesus through the waters of baptism. Now, as we work our way through a couple of Scriptures today, I want us to see how important it is to follow Jesus in baptism. If you haven't taken the step yourselves, again, there should be response cards. You can fill those out. Hand them to me after service. But I want you to take that step today. Even if it's just learning more about it. You're not quite sure, that's fine. Just say, I'm interested to know more about it. And that's okay. You see... Baptism marks us. It's like a brand for us where we belong to Jesus. We do what He did to identify ourselves with Him. It's a declaration to the world that we're taken. The devil's got no claim on me, I'm His. It's also a very important reminder for us to live for Jesus. So as we're going to see, baptism does not stop temptation, nor does it end sin in our lives. Rather, the devil almost refocuses his efforts on us because he wants us to stumble and fall and ruin our reputation because in so doing, it does damage the church. And so it's important for us to, especially when we've been baptized, to make sure we're walking the straight and narrow. And if we do sin and stumble and fall, to get back up again, repent, repent, and ask for forgiveness. There is no doubt in my mind that there is a reason why Jesus was baptized and immediately went to the wilderness for 40 days and that's where the devil came to him himself and tempted him. And we're going to take another look. Or take a look at another scripture in Romans chapter 6. It talks about baptism in the context of sin and repentance. And I don't think that was an accident. Marking yourselves as belonging to God puts a mark on your back that the devil is seeking out. He wants to undermine our examples. Repentance and grace are vital parts of the church. And if we do stumble and fall, they are there for us. We can dig deeper into that another day. But baptism is a crucial step for all Christians. For all of us. Especially in the early stages of our journeys of faith. So first up, the scripture that we read, Mark chapter 1, and we're going to focus in on verses 9 through 13. But that opening to the Gospel of Mark, where it kind of gives a brief biography about John the Baptist, John, we know, is a precursor to Jesus. He paved the way. John was literally prophesied about back in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, and Malachi 3, 1. The footnotes should be in your Bibles. And Mark quotes from those passages. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. That was John's role. That's what he did. That was his purpose, his mission in life. He came to point to Jesus. People came to him and he would point to Jesus. That's kind of our our role too, isn't it? People might come to us, but we need to point them to Jesus. 
And so as he fulfilled his missions, the crowds drew in. They came to hear him, the, hear him preach. He preached about the coming Messiah and, and how important Jesus would be. He preached about the importance for repentance from sin and for forgiveness for those sins. And then he would baptize them as a symbol of that forgiveness, of that declaration that I, I need to be better. And it was revolutionary for John to do this because he wasn't baptizing those, those that wanted to become Jews. He was baptizing the Jews because they were being convicted about the sin that was still in their lives. Being a Jew was not enough to be saved. He still needed to deal with the problem of sin. Sin was the problem. And so in preaching about repentance and forgiveness for sins, the people came, they responded by being baptized in the Jordan River. And I want you to keep in mind that relationship between baptism and repentance because, like I said, it comes up again. As John was baptizing, Jesus comes along and other Gospels give some important details here, but Mark's kinda, Mark kind of keeps it short and it's good enough for our purposes today. Mark 1, 9 through 11. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and a spirit, or, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven came You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now, how many of us would like to hear God speak from the clouds? Be kind of neat, wouldn't it? How often does that happen? Not that much. But when it does, you know it's significant. And there's only a, a small handful of times where God speaks from the clouds throughout the Gospels. But when it does, it's usually not for Jesus' benefit. It's for the benefit of those that hear. They hear these booming words from the sky. What, what do you think that's telling there is something completely special about this guy. He is not ordinary at all. But the, boy, the voice says the message, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Who but God speaks from the clouds. And how many times does Jesus openly admit in the Gospels that He is the Son of God? Generally speaking, He kind of keeps that hush-hush and people have to figure that out as they see Him in action. He would tell his disciples this, and we, we tell, the, tell the world about this. But those booming words told the people gathered around that day. God speaking from the clouds is a rare but primary clue to Jesus' identity as the Son of God. However, the fact that Jesus was baptized at all is significant. And I want you to think about this. What was John's message? Be baptized, why? For repentance for sins. And then along comes Jesus. Jesus, in all of human history, is the only one that actually didn't need to repent of anything. And so the question remains, of why did Jesus get baptized? If baptism, especially John's baptism, was about repentance and forgiveness of sins, and Jesus had no sins to repent of, why did He get baptized? Now, part of it could be prophetic fulfillment in what Jesus was doing. I know Matthew's Gospel mentions uh, something along the lines of to fulfill all righteousness. And you can figure out what that means and study that for yourselves. But I believe for Jesus in that moment, it was He wasn't repenting of sins because He had committed no sins to repent of. But Jesus knew His mission more clearly than any of us. And He knew He would get followed. And he knew those followers would need an example to follow. And he knew that for the lives of those followers, baptism would be an important step. They would need repentance and forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus was baptized so that when he says, follow me, baptism is a part of it. This is connected with Jesus is great commission. Not only does he tell us to follow me like he told his disciples, but then he commissions his disciples and those of us who follow him. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, 
What does it say there? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. To be a disciple of Jesus is to get baptized. That's an important part of it. But you must choose it for yourself. And that's one of the distinctives of the Baptist church. Because you, you probably have contact with people from other, other churches, Catholics in particular, and well known for baptizing babies. We don't do that here. Because our understanding of it is you have to choose it for yourself. You need to choose to be baptized. That is your choice to make. You intentionally follow Jesus. So have you chosen that for yourself? Maybe you need to. Is today the day? We'll see. Next up, I want you to open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we'll start there. And I want to ask you the question as you're turning there. How do you know what belongs to who? I've worked enough construction jobs over the years where I, work, I walk onto a construction site and there's a bunch of people working on various things. How do you know what belongs to who? If you were to go and grab a drill sit, sitting on the ground, is someone going to yell at you? Hey, that's mine! How would they know? How would you know? How do you identify things that belong to you? You put your name on it. I heard someone say that. Yeah, you put your name on it. Nice black Sharpie pen or whatever. You put your mark on it, your brand. This belongs to me because it's got my name on it, see? That's how you make sure, do your best to make sure that no one walks away with your tools. I mean, let's face it, that is unfortunately still a possibility. But you put your name on it. It doesn't matter if it's a hand tool or a power tool or sometimes a musical instrument or if you're at school, you put your name on your binder your lunch kit, maybe you work at, a, at an office or something and there's a shared refrigerator, you've got to put your name on your lunch or someone else will eat it, right? You put your name on it. Now what does a company do to mark you as theirs? They might give you a uniform. They might give you a name tag or a badge, something to identify that you are not just a customer, but you are there to help the customer, right? There might be a dress code. They're going to put their logo on. How do you know when someone joins a sports team? When you're going to watch a CFL game, it's not just a bunch of guys wearing their, their street clothes. They all got jerseys on, right? So you can tell the teams apart. Some of you might be hardcore enough to be able to tell without the uniforms, I'm not that guy. I would need the uniforms. Well, that guy's wearing green, that guy's wearing blue. That's right, we got the clash of the, the provinces represented in the congregation here. So, <laughs> But the uniform that you wear identifies you. It identifies you as if you work at Walmart, you've got the uniform on. If you work at the co-op, you've got the uniform on. If you're a policeman, you've got a uniform on. If you're a fireman, a soldier, you're going to have something to identify what you do, who you belong to. But what do we have as Christians? Do we have a Jesus fish on our bumpers? Do we wear a cross around our necks? Do we get a Christian tattoo, scripture verse or something? What do we do? How do, we, how do we mark ourselves as belonging to God? Maybe the better question is not so much what do we do to identify ourselves as Christians, but what does God do to identify us as His? You see, God marks us with the Holy Spirit. He does this upon conversion. When John pointed to Jesus and he said, there's one coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John says, I baptize with water, but one is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And guess what's in there? It's not a tank full of the Holy Spirit. I wish that it was, but I'm not Jesus. I'm more like John than Jesus. I baptize with water. But Jesus still baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so upon conversion, when you give your life to Christ, when you accept Him into your heart and believe in Him, the Holy Spirit marks you. You now belong to God. But there is something we can do 
to turn that around and tell the world that yes, we belong to God because the marking of the Holy Spirit is an internal thing and it will show through our actions, but there's not a visible outside thing that changes. But baptism is. It's a, a declaration, a public declaration of the faith in Jesus and our intention to follow Him. And I've often said it this way, and I still say it again. It's an outward step of obedience to demonstrate what Christ has done on the inside. Water baptism is our way of declaring to the world we are His, we belong to Him, we follow Him. The world does not have a claim on me. And if it tries, it's, it's a thief. It's trying to steal me away from where I rightly belong. When we choose baptism for ourselves, we should radically transform our thinking. The whole lives, our faith should be obvious to anyone who watches. Anyone who's watching us because they are watching. When we get baptized, people are watching us. Okay. They're declaring that they belong to Jesus. How does that make them different from me? And you're in a living testimony will declare that. Paul talks about this somewhat in Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. We're going to continue working our way through that in a few moments. But just right then and there, did you notice the connection between sin, temptation, repentance, and baptism? Kind of like when Jesus was baptized, went into the wilderness, and was tempted by the devil? There is a connection there because it's a, it's a battleground. If we follow Jesus, we should be striving to live our lives free of sin, free of shame. If we stumble, if we fall, we must repent. We must ask for forgiveness. We know those scriptures like 1 John 1, 9, that God is faithful and just and willing to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But that connection between sin, repentance, and baptism is significant and it's important. If we follow Jesus in baptism, we mark ourselves in, in that way, that we belong to Jesus. That the sin doesn't have a place in our lives, and if it's there, it shouldn't be. We need to strive to purge it, expunge it from our lives. We can no longer sin unrepentantly and still call ourselves Christians. If there's sin in our lives, repent. Ask for forgiveness. And walk the righteous path once again. Now look specifically at what Paul says about baptism. What does it say? We were baptized into Christ Jesus, but what does it say about it? We were baptized into his death. And baptism is a picture of dying to sin. Being lowered into the water undeniably represents dying in kind of the burial, right? We're, we're identifying with Jesus Christ and his death. But Paul says, where there, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. He goes on to say that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so too we come up from the water. This is, a, this is the picture of immersion baptism. We come up from the water. We were raised from the dead. or Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too may live a new life. Baptism is that picture. Baptism doesn't just picture the death of Jesus because that would be incomplete. It pictures the resurrection. To be immersed in the waters of, of baptism symbolizes the death and resurrection of Christ. By being baptized, we follow Jesus. God puts His mark on us through the Holy Spirit. We declare to the world that we belong to Him through baptism. It is the mark that we wear to tell the world to whom we belong. And then we strive to live our lives holy and honorably as befitting a holy and honor, honorable God. But moving on, Romans 6, 5-14, through 14, we need to live like Jesus. Baptism is a complete picture of what we have in Jesus. But as we follow Jesus into baptism, we're marked by baptism, and then we are called to live like Jesus as a result of our baptism. The promise of a life lived faithfully is spelled out for us as Paul continues, verses 
5 through 14 here in Romans 6. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, He cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once and for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness." For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. So let's break down what that teaches there. First of all, he's talking about the death of Jesus. Paul very clearly states that as we live our lives faithfully for Jesus, we share his experiences. Verse 6, for we know that our old self was crucified with him. He crucified our sins to that cross. Our old self was crucified in so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That's why when we talk about our old selves, that's what we're talking about. Our old selves was nailed to the cross with Jesus so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, it goes on to say. The emphasis is on freedom from sin. By sharing in his crucifixion and in his death and burial through baptism, we are set free from the chains of slavery to sin and by extension death. Anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Wages of sin is death. Once the wages have been paid, you're free to go. Secondly, Paul talks about resurrection. If baptism represents the fact that we've died with him, we've been buried with him, we will be brought back to life with him, and then we are assured of the promise of the resurrection. Just as Jesus came back to life and death no longer has power over him, he still sits at the Father's right hand, waiting for the time when he comes back to gather his saints to himself. So too will our resurrection free us from the power of sin and death. <clears throat> we won't be brought back to life to die again like Lazarus would have been. When we get brought back to life, it will be for eternity. It will be permanent. We will experience life eternal in heaven with Jesus, united with him. If verse 10 is true for Jesus and we share in what he went through, then the death that he died, he died once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. That's our calling now. The death that we died, we were crucified with Christ. We died once for all. In the life we now live, we live to God. That is our calling. We live for God's glory and to establish His kingdom. Thirdly, Paul is talking about a moral calling, a high calling for morality. Sin needs to be dead to us. We need to be dead to sin. Romans 6.11 says, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And it talks about the imagery of don't offer up any part of yourselves for its wickedness. We all know what temptation feels like. We know the tug and the pull that it has on us. We know how powerful it can be. <coughs> but we also know that sin fails to reflect God. And it is a shortcoming. It is shameful. But God has freed us from sin. He's unlocked the chains. He's set us free. So we need to do our best to walk away from those chains. This is an intentional thing. You cannot do it by accident, and it is not easy. It is a hard thing to do, to walk away from the sinful patterns in our lives. And we are still tempted. We do still stumble and fall, but we are not talking about accidental sin. We are talking about unrepentant sin. If you are not sorry for the sin in your lives, you're walking a dangerous path. Now, I recently heard a speaker, and some of our guests would recognize this because they were there hearing him too. I appreciated what he had to say. One thing that he said repeatedly stuck with me. God's Word is a book of principles and a book of promises. If you live by the principles, you can stand on the promises. But if you violate the principles, you're in big, big trouble. That stuck with me. And I'd like to unpack that in another message another day, but think about that. We worship a holy God who has given us a book of principles to live by. God says, live this way. 
This tells you how to live. And in living this way, it promises certain things to you. God will love you. God will take care of you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. So if you're living by the principles, you know the promises to be true. You'll experience them full well. But if you violate those principles, what does that say? Well, there are some promises about that too. And Israel's history is a living example of that as they obeyed God and God blessed them and as they turned their back from God and God allowed them to be oppressed by others. If we call ourselves Christians and there is unrepentant sin in our lives, we are violating the principles and big, big trouble is on the horizon. But as I bring this message to a close today, the beauty of the gospel message is that as we follow Jesus in baptism, we are marked by Jesus through baptism, then we can live our lives for Jesus as a result of our choices, choosing baptism being one of them. As baptism sets us apart from the rest of the world, it is imperative that we understand the role sin plays in undermining the role in the lives of a Christian. The devil wants us to stray from the path God has set before us. There's no mistake that Jesus says there is a wide way that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to salvation. And the narrow way is hard to find. It's really easy to stumble and fall and, and take the wide path. And if the devil can get us to stumble and fall, and if the devil can get us to tarnish our witness, some people may be prevented from witnessing the transformative powers of Christ in their lives. And notice how the devil tempts Jesus after baptism. Notice also how Paul talks about baptism as a primary reason to avoid sin. To be a Christian, to follow Jesus, is a high calling and one that we can have to take seriously. We cannot say we're a Christian and keep on sinning unrepentantly. We must not look to the world for how to live. If we look to the world and say, I like that, I want that, I want to live that way, and still have Jesus in my life, we're fooling ourselves. We can't do that. Do not look to the world. Be transformed by the Word of God. Look to Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. He didn't say, you can be my disciple as you do whatever you want. He said, follow me. And then he gave a living example of what he wants. Follow me means watch what I do and then do that. And making disciples is that. We follow him until we're doing it ourselves and then we turn around and we tell someone, follow me because I'm following him. And it's a, a long line to follow the leader leader being Christ. Baptism is a very important life of, event in the life of a Christian. It's the moment you choose for yourself to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's the moment you tell the world that you belong to Jesus. It's the moment you take seriously your faith that you've been given by God and to strive to live it out to the best of your ability. If you feel God tugging at your heart to get baptized, fill out those little cards in front of you. Hand it to me after service. Talk to me after service. Give me a call throughout the week. Whatever it takes. I want to help. I want to encourage you. But for now, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the day. I thank you for your word and how it powerfully speaks to what you want of us. And I pray, Father, for, for baptism. I pray for Ethan as he is about to get baptized here that you would continue to encourage his heart, Father, and as he follows you physically with his feet into the waters of baptism. I pray that it would inspire the rest of us. If we were baptized, Father, that we would be inspired to live our faith more intentionally and strive to, to live it out more visibly. And if we have not been baptized, I pray that we'd be encouraged to inquire more. Father, you're a good God. We thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that sermon, Adam. And as Ethan and Adam go get ready for a baptism, we're going to stand and sing The River.
from despair I am going to that river Lord I need to meet you there precious Jesus I am ready to surrender every care take my to get baptized was the one who stirred up the water. We learned that the hard way. All right. This will be perfect. All right. Ethan. One of the practices that we love to do here in our church is we have a Bible verse for everyone that gets baptized for you. Proverbs 4 verse 23 spoke out to me. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. I have a couple questions for you. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for your sins and rose from the dead on the third day? Yes. Have you, in a personal way, accepted him as your Savior and Lord? Yes. Okay. Then in response to his command and upon your request, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As I stand in these waters, the baptistry is warm. The invitation is out there. Is there anyone who feels the call to be baptized today? If not, that's fine. Fill out those cards. I'd love to hear from you later for the next time we, uh, we do one. I see a hand, but are you ready for it? <laughs> no? <laughs> All right. Maybe next time, okay, bud? <laughs> Seeing Ethan being baptized by his dad reminds me of my baptism. Because it was my dad who baptized me. And now that he's gone, it's a very special memory. And so we just want to sing together. This is amazing grace.
back into order Who makes the orphan a son or daughter The King of glory, the King of glory Who makes the nations with truth and justice Shines in the onion, all of its silence The King of glory, the King above all Someone who was raised in a very conservative home by a Mennonite preacher <laughs> and now in a Baptist church we're very calm I'm very glad that some people feel free to praise God with lifting their hands and clapping their hands and dancing about because that's what this song is about God breaks that power over us and he just declares us free and so I'm very glad that we can be free and that the next song is who you say I am and that God declares that we are his we are not when we accept him he chooses us and he loves us Yes, he died for 
words again. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. And if you cannot say that today, please do not walk out of this church before you can say that. See me, see Pastor Adam, any of our church people would be glad to pray with you. That. We are so blessed to have had you join us for church this Sunday. We trust and, bless and, and pray that uh, God will bless you and watch over you throughout the week. And uh, if again, if you're at all interested in baptism or membership or you want to learn more, let me know about it. God bless. We'll see you next Sunday.